Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Catherine Dold with CNEN and I'll be moderating today's event. This webinar is titled Recent Advances in Peptide Drug Discovery and is being sponsored by Wuxi Aptech. CNEN works with sponsors to identify topics of interest and value to CNEN's audience and consistent with their mission to provide news and analysis of the chemistry enterprise in a timely, accurate, and balanced fashion. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse. If you need technical assistance, please look for the Help widget at the bottom of the screen or type your query into the Q&A box. If you get disconnected during the webcast, please log back in according to the instructions you received earlier. You're encouraged to contribute to the success of this webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. Our speakers will answer them at the end of the presentation, and as your moderator, I will be posing as many as time permits. Any questions that we are not able to get to in today's broadcast will be answered by email after the event. Please note that CNEN does not endorse any company, products, or services that may be mentioned in the webinar, and that the webinar will be archived at CNEN Online after the live webcast. Our presentation today is being sponsored by Wuxi Aptech. Wuxi Aptech provides a broad portfolio of R&D and manufacturing services that enable the global pharmaceutical and healthcare industries to advance discoveries and deliver groundbreaking treatments to patients. Through its unique business models, Wuxi Aptech's integrated end-to-end -end services include chemistry drug, CRDMO, or Contract Research Development and Manufacturing Organizations, Biology Discovery, Preclinical Testing and Clinical Research Services, and Cell and Gene Therapies, CTDMO, or Contract Testing Development and Manufacturing Organization, all helping customers improve the productivity of advancing healthcare products through cost-effective and efficient solutions. Our speakers today are Alex Setz, Executive Director, Wuxi Aptech, and Head of Wuxi Biology, DB Europe, and Anthony Silvestri, Head of Discovery Chemistry at Unnatural Products. I'll now hand the program over to our first speaker, Anthony Silvestri. Hi, um, I'm Tony Silvestri. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, and we'll just dive right in here. So, a little uh, first slide from Wuxi, um, just you know, overviewing this, the the talk here: macrocyclic peptide DNA encoded libraries, um, and then moving forward, um, we'll show you our beautiful title screen. Will you go to the next slide, please? That's great. Um, and then on to the overview uh, of what we'll be discussing today. So um, we're going to just chat about, um, you know, uh, maybe some de novo discovery methods of peptide macrocycles and what we believe to be, you know, good methods or or kind of the top methods in the field to, to make peptide ma uh, macrocycles or, or find de novo ligands. Um, and... Uh, and we'll go over exactly what we mean by good and essentially mean that, you know, finding de novo peptides or finding peptides in a de novo manner that have, uh, uh, you know, good uh, 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 physiochemical properties. Um, and I'll show you a couple, you know, literature examples and just um, how Wuxi Dell fits into that, that paradigm. Um, and then we'll go through kind of some uh, 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 Dell design and overview and uh, um, subsequently screening and enrichment analyses and off DNA hit follow up uh, that we performed with Wuxi um, in the context of our most previous or our most recent paper <clears throat> in ACS MedChem Let. I'll have a little slide about that. And then we'll open it up for just closing thoughts and discussion uh, subsequently. So um, here I'm just showing you, um, you know, placing or putting macrocycles in their in their place here. So you know they are of intermediate size between small molecules and biologics, and you know, thus they have kind of convergent properties of both. Um, they are you know similar to antibodies in um, and 
uh, many biologics in general, uh, because they're able to um, target diffuse or, or uh, uh, flat pro uh, protein surfaces that are that characterize most protein protein interactions. Um, and so they're able to you know go in there and disrupt uh, protein protein interactions in a similar way to antibodies. Um, they're very similar to small molecules in the sense that you know when when properly optimized, uh, they can passively permeate uh, membranes and have uh, small molecule like distributions <clears throat> um, and uh, just you know uh, uh, pharmacokinetic properties in general. And so this kind of makes uh, macrocycles. Um, you know, I guess I'll say that that this is kind of evinced by nature's macrocycles, uh, which there are you know hundreds of that are approved. Uh, the 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 north the North Star being uh, cyclosporin, of course, um, and that, uh, you know, here at UNP, we seek to um, optimize or use those, that, that North Star of cyclosporin, um, in addition to all these other macrocycles that, that, that Mother Nature has provided us, uh, use the uh, attributes of those to guide us uh, towards uh, developing Thing, um, synthetic peptide macrocycles uh, to any target that that uh, that we'd like or uh, our partners would like. And so, uh, moving forward here, one slide Alex. We really think that you know these these two properties um, of, of of macrocycles, the ability to bind uh, shallow protein surfaces and their ability to have small molecule like PK, makes them particularly useful for. Uh, uh, for two major reasons, or in two major use cases here, one of them is is um, oral uh, as a um, or being used as oral replacements for injectable drugs, uh, so antibody replacements, um, and uh, drugging intracellular protein protein um, interactions that that small molecules typically struggle to, um, and. Uh, you know, on the outset of any program here, it's 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 quite difficult to find quality de novo hits um, or de novo hits in general against difficult targets. Um, and and then if you move forward, else, um, and what I'll showcase here just from the literature is is are a couple examples that that have come from you know two of the most um, uh, well used and well developed uh, display technologies uh, to generate de novo hits, both mRNA display and phage display, and here. Just showing you some some folks that 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 we think do great work in the space, um, uh, respectively, and then um, just just an example here of a KRAS G12D um, uh, RAF inhibitor um, that was reported by Kevon uh, Shokat uh, Hiroki Suga um, maybe five, five years ago. This molecule turned KD2. and and I'm just pointing out here that that this by no means is is uh, or, or by anyone's interpretation, very drug-like. However, um, you know, it bound this, this, um, and and in, interrupted this interesting interaction, uh, and and may represent a, a you know valuable starting point for um, subsequent medchem. Uh, it still has a long way to go from anyone's wrecking them. And then, uh, if you move forward, an example from uh, phage display um, is is uh, another report that came around in the in the. Um, and similar time frame, maybe 2018, of this KRAS sauce inhibitor um, called Carapep2D from Takeda. Uh, Sakamoto, I think, was the the, the primary author here. Um, but but just showing you that you know this this compound, which they um, you know polyarginated to uh, induce um, uh, local or uh, internalization into the cell, um, is is. Is certainly a, a a glaring example of just you know what is not passively cell permeable, I think. And then um, if you were to say you know okay, well the arginines are you know obviously put there to to induce uh, internalization via a mechanism that's not passive cell permeability, um, and you move to a trimmed analog, you trim those arginine antlers off. Uh, you move to a pep 2 d trimmed, I'll call it. Um, and, but still, you know, uh, is, is, uh, you know, suffers from high molecular weight, um, you know, negative, uh, carboxylic acids, so negative one charge, um, as well as a number of hydrogen bond donors on a pretty large, uh, total polar surface area, um, as well. So moving forward here, just trying to quantify, um, these, these, uh, uh, these negative attributes of that KRPEP2D trim molecule, 
Um, I want to just give you some physical chemical, some physiochemical rules of thumb that that maybe you can use as a heuristic, um, or that or that we we can um, to uh, optimize peptides after their initial discovery. Um, so just to give you a sense of how bad you know maybe that molecule, uh, the trim molecule there is from a uh, uh, from a permeability standpoint, I'm showing you uh, some work from Scott Loki's lab where they made. Um, a set of uh, six mer, um, a set of hexapeptides that have um, hydrogen bond or no external hydrogen bond donors in the top left, class A, um, and then moving to class B, a single hydrogen bond donor on the um, uh, side chain, a single hydrogen bond donor on the um, back peptide backbone, class C, and then class D, which has two peptide, or I mean, two uh, uh, hydrogen bond donors one on the uh, side chain, one on the backbone. And I'm just showing you here, it's a simple correlation between uh, four, uh, you know, these sets mixed together. Um, uh, they're partitioning um, in decadiene versus water um, as it relates to uh, uh, permeability as measured in PAMPA. And so what you can see is as you become more lipophilic and increase your, your, part, your um, uh, partitioning into decadiene, um, you, you, you reach kind of a maximum uh, permeability around maybe one, um, and then and then that drops off, and and this this drop off has been shown to be a consequence of uh, just increasing uh, lipophilicity to a to a point that's detrimental, um, such that you get um, just aggregation and solution, and so you're unable to you know or these these aggregates are unable to uh, move across the cell membrane. Of course, they have to be monomeric uh, to, to to transverse that pamphlet membrane. So, and then one more slide, please. Thank you. Um, and and so uh, that's just a correlation between log D um, and PAMPA. Here I'm showing you just A log P. So they're, you know, um, atomistic uh, uh, lipophilicity versus log D. And so what you can see here is um, for those molecules on the far left, each one of those classes, uh, as you can see maybe by the, um, the little boxes or circles, um, each one of those classes is one of these lines. Um, and so you can see that the circled uh, compounds in the top that, that are in that permeable quadrant, those um, have no hydrogen bond donors. When you add one hydrogen bond donor uh, um, to either the side chain or the backbone, you then you know, decrease this line um, just in general. And, and, and this is interesting in the fact that you don't really, uh, that uh, it doesn't matter too much, you know, whether you're on um, the hydrogen bond donors on um, uh, the side chain or the backbone, but suffice it to say that they're both, you know, external, external facing hydrogen bond uh, in a transannular fashion. Uh, and then when you add both of them, you get a, you know, corresponding decrease to those Xs. Um, and so, you know, if you take a given A log P, <clears throat> let's say maybe three here, um, and you, and then you go ahead and look at the y-axis. You see that corresponds to a negative three um, log d. Take that and move it back over to the other graph, and you can see that your PAMPA permeability for that scaffold is 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 quite terrible in the case of the um, X compounds and the class D compounds. If you look at the a, same a log p for let's say uh, the single hydrogen bond donor containing compounds, either the squares or the stars. Uh, you see that your log D then increases to negative one, um, and then take that again back over to the lefternmost graph and uh, look at that. And now you're, you know, observable in Pampa, uh, maybe uh, uh, 10 to the negative seventh. Take that to a compound that has no uh, hydrogen bond donors, the circles at, at, a, at a given A log P. Uh, and you can see then that you're uh, up around one log D and you are, you know, in the very, you know, quote, very permeable range for, for maybe sick, for uh, cyclic peptides. So this is just to say that um, every exposed hydrogen bond donor, heuristically, is kind of a 1.5 log unit penalty um, in uh, uh, PAMPA or just in uh, permeability in general. Um, so definitely want to minimize those. And then moving forward, um, in addition, you um, also considering uh, the molecular size um, and volume specifically of 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 these molecules, um, and this is again some some work from Loki uh, from Scott Loki's lab, um, and uh, showing that that once you move above maybe if you look at the seven hundred fifty 
um, uh, cubic angstroms, uh, you you get a massive drop off uh, in membrane diffusion um, as you increase that 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 volume, and so you can see cyclosporin there called out. Um, and so every hundred angstroms uh, cubic uh, beyond 750 incurs about a one log unit penalty to permeability as well. Um, and moving forward again. Um, I'll call out here that 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 of course, and just just reminding us that uh, you know only neutral species are able to passively permeate the membrane, and so this is just showing you that um, you know the unionizable caffeine molecule is not pH dependent on the right uh, in the top right. Uh, you can see there the the flux, which is just um, concentration of the molecule in an acceptor versus uh, the donor over the over a time frame, a uh, certain time frame on the bottom there in hours. Uh, you can see that flux uh, doesn't change uh, as a function of pH. Now that's not true for bases or acids below it. Of course, when you when you up, um, in the case of the you know propranolol, what you're seeing here is that you know at um, high pHs where that where that um, as propylamine is protonated, um, uh, or excuse me, low pHs where that where that is protonated, uh, you see zero flux. Um, and uh, as you move towards the pKa of that base, uh, in terms of pH of the uh, of the solution, you then get to a neutral form of it, and it's able to transverse the cell membrane. Same thing with the acids, but in the inverse sense, um, <clears throat> of course. So um, this kind of puts into uh, a context or, or quantifies each of those things that we're trying to minimize on the outset of of kind of any program uh, or trying to minimize for any scaffold series that that we're working with, uh, minimizing hydrogen bond donors, minimizing molecular weight, molecular volume, um, and then and then really trying to drive towards a neutral species because that's what we know is going to be permeable. And then, yeah, thank you. So so coming back here, just, just looking at the impact of all of these, and so um, kind of tallying these up, and I'll caveat this with with um, with saying that that you know these these may not be fully uh, um, additive, but if they're anywhere near additive, uh, you'll be able to see just just how much of a you know massive impact um, each one of these uh, kind of negative attributes from a physical chemical property standpoint uh, 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 can have. So, um, looking at the hydrogen bond donor count, you have fourteen total in the molecule, but six exposed. So we'll only count those, and at one point five. Um, uh, log units each in in presumed permeability. We're looking at a you know a, a, a decrease in the PAMPA permeability by by nine by nine um, log units. Um, moving to the size, um, I'm showing you just the molecular weight, um, but really the best to to look at here, and I uh, should have included um, is that uh, you really want to look at the um, uh, the cubic volume. Um, and you know, surprisingly, for these molecules uh, that are of this size, the especially or particularly for this one, the cubic volume is 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 um, uh, is about the exact same as the molecular weight. So, looking at a Van der Waals um, volume for this molecule, it's about three uh, thirteen hundred and uh, fourteen angstroms uh, cubed. So, uh, pretty similar to the molecular weight, oddly. Um, so taking this um, and uh, uh, adding these together for you know uh, a loss of one log unit per hundred angstroms cubed, uh, you have um, a decrease in the perceived or or uh, presumed pampa by by five log units. Um, and then again with the the charge state is a little different here. Um, generally, we see a decrease in maybe a hundred to a thousand fold uh, based on the uh, whether you're ionizing or, or whether you have an acid or a base. Um, and then of course the pH that you're running that 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 permeability system at has a massive effect because um, of course you're 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 sh you're shifting around your population of of neutral species uh just depending on the pH uh, and the pK of whatever you're looking at. So but in general we're about a hundred or a thousand fold uh different there. So if you move forward one else. So you know at adding these up um, you get a predicted permeability of of uh, e to the negative seventeen, which is which is um, really really low, of course. Um, 
So th this is in, you know, maybe to put this in a uh, perspective, we usually see, um, uh, we can observe compounds that are, uh, are in Pampa that, that have fluxes of around E to the negative nine, um, E to the negative 10. Sometimes we have a, a, a an Orbi trap in house. Um, and so even if you're able to, you know, I think this correlates to about one nanomolar. Um, and even if you're able to, um, you know, observe down to that range, E to the negative 10th, you're still about 10 million fold off of what you're even able to observe. So it's very hard when optimizing this uh, without using heuristics or in our case, um, developed a couple models to, to um, really facilitate our um, optimization of these kinds of compounds. But even using these heuristics, you're, you're, you're very far off and, uh, but you're able to, um, you know, guide this molecule uh, to where you really want to be, which is, you know, in the observably permeable space. Um, but, but still you have a, about a 10 million fold uh, uh, offset from what you're able to observe. Um, so, you know, this is all to say that initial mRNA and phase display hits because you're using these, these, these uh, 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 pseudo translational machinery to generate these hits, you're using a lot of uh, canonical amino acids, proteinogenic amino acids that that in many cases are. Um, Suga has done a bunch of work to to uh, incorporate um, non naturals and, and methylated species, but uh, still, I would say the um, uh, by and large, you're you're uh, when you're using these these platforms, you're generating compounds that are uh, charged. Um, and have a lot of hydrogen bond donors. And, and so this requires a ton of med chem to do uh, or for you to do uh, to get it to a place where you would you would consider taking this molecule forward. Um, and so these don't possess, you know, passive permeability on the outset. So you really got to um, uh, develop that for these molecules. So just coming back to the two major use cases, you could argue that, you know, well, maybe you don't really care about that because you're not trying to passively permeate membranes, you're hitting cell surface receptors. And so if you move forward, you know, you're just trying to replace a biologic. Um, and then one more slide, Alex. So. Thank you. No, 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 fine. Thank you. Um, you can say, well, um, you know, there are tons of examples and most, you know, I'll call this one out, um, which is a really, really nice example and, and some heroic med chem by the Merck team. Um, but that, um, you know, I'm not trying, you know, you can make the argument, I'm not trying to passively uh, permeate membranes. I want to hit self surface receptors. I'm just replacing an antibody. And as long as it gets some amount of distribution um, and I can use an enabled formulation uh, uh, to facilitate oral absorption, then I should be fine. And that's, and that's, um, a reasonable argument, but I'll, but I would counter with the fact that a significant amount of med chem must be done. I think this, this med chem story spans, I think a decade. Um, <clears throat> but, but just looking at this oral extracellular, this oral PCSK9 that, that, that I would, I think everyone is, uh, uh, familiar with, um, but you can see in the top left, um, you know, an initial, um, mRNA display hit that they got, um, again, doesn't look, uh, drug-like from anyone's uh, um, perspective, I would argue. Um, and then and then the final molecule, Merck uh, 0616 at the very bottom there. Um, and, and I know that they did, you know, reading through these papers here in the middle uh, of that figure on the right, um, you can see they did do a lot of medicinal chemistry focused on just increasing um, uh, the binding affinity um, but then also a number of, uh, they made a number of modifications, of course, to decrease um, uh, metabolic liabilities and uh, 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 um, hydrogen bond donor count as well as molecular weight. So this, this um, and, and you can kind of see that reflected in the final molecule down here, Merck 0616, um, in that it's this, these bicyclizations where they got the efficacy and then they've, they've made a number of, of uh, uh, substitutions to then uh, get over the specific metabolism. And I believe mast cell degranulation was an issue for them um, <clears throat> as well. But um, if you move forward, um, this this molecule, I've, I've, I've been seeing, or I haven't seen the structure of it, but this Janssen molecule, which if anyone has the, or knows of the structure, or, or if it's publicly available, would love to, um, to see that or be made um, uh, aware of it. Um, but this is also another example of a cyclic peptide that is um, uh, 
it, wherein its its uh, oral bioavailability is facilitated by an enabled formulation. And so really this is just, you know, these molecules are not passively self permeable, but they're able to permeate the gut with the use of these, um, or if you go back one sec, this one, oh, sorry, you skipped one, sorry, that was right here, yeah. Um, so these enabled formulations just take advantage of, of, of molecules uh, like this that you see on the bottom right, sodium caprate or, or snack, um, in addition to a lot of uh, uh, medium and long chain um, excipients that are able to um, uh, uh, permeabilize uh, the epithelial lining of the stomach and the intestines um, and, and induce paracellular and transcellular permeation, both to get into um, the the bloodstream directly, but also the lymphatic system and, and um, by, bypass um, direct um, uh, inclusion into the bloodstream. So um, these are really um, enabled in that way. And and um, oh, if you go forward, yeah. But the um, the point here is that you know for these molecules, there's still a significant amount of med chem that was required to take them from these display techniques. Um, and then bring them to a place where they where these enabled formulations could facilitate it. So, you know, of course, folks aren't just pulling mRNA and phage display hits um, and then doing a little bit of metabolism optimization um, and then having a drug. Um, so I, I, um, so I think there is still a significant amount of med chem to do and uh, getting to a point where you're pulling off a platform compounds that are physicochemically evolved um, or developed already uh, is 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 a massive boon um, and and something that 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 we should um, target and, uh, and endeavor to have moving forward. And in addition, you're throwing away 95% of the material here uh, when you are dosing these um, orally. I'll just call out, of course. Uh, and then moving forward. Cool. So that that kind of goes over the oral replacements. I still believe that there are, you know, a, a ton of medchem to do on those. Um, and they're not, you know, you can't just pull them from the the, the de novo libraries. Um, and then looking more at um, kind of our uh, bread and butter uh, is uh, drugging intracellular protein-protein interactions uh, that small molecules struggle to. Um, and I'll just call out this one example from the literature of a molecule that's in the clinic. Um, yeah, if you move forward. Alex, thank you. Um, yeah, this is a fantastic molecule from our perspective. Um, you know, so we're staying with the um, with the uh, KRAS theme here, but but this was uh, this report just came out in JAX, um, really showcasing the the med chem that was used to develop uh, this molecule Luna eighteen, which is a clinical um, uh, KRAS sauce inhibitor um, from Chugai, um, and. And I want to just uh, if you move forward one, Alex. You know, if you remember back to those those uh, kind of heuristic arguments I was making, um, compare Luna eighteen to Merck zero six one six, and and you can see that you know a, you can see that there's a decreased molecular weight, of course, uh, you know, totally neutral, and then maybe most importantly, um, the hydrogen bond donors that are externally facing is, is is very very much minimized and so in the context of of you know merc 0616 um its uh, physical chemical properties and number of hydrogen bond donors that molecule has maybe a 2.5 percent um bioavailability whereas a truly passively cell permeable compound like luna 18 is is up around in the small the small molecule range um, of around, you know, maybe 35% on average. Um, so, and, and so this just really uh, juxtaposes these two um, and uh, uh, calls out that, uh, or defines the, the kind of, even most simply, the, 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 um, uh, the properties you want the your, your molecule to have if you're trying to target uh, passive cell permeability. Uh, and then one more, Alex. And so, you know, when thinking about developing either oral replacements for injectables or peptides targeting intracellular pro protein interactions, um, I would say that, yeah, you do have to do a um, significant med chem to get to the place where they're either, you know, in the context of molecules like uh, 616, um, 
you have to do MedChem to, to allow those enabled formulations. Uh, uh, you have to get it close enough to where those enabled formulations will push you over the, the, the tipping point and give you oral bioavailability. Um, then, of course, in the context of, of making a peptide that is truly intracellular uh, passive cell permeability, um, imbuing that, that, that lead compound with passive cell permeability requires um, a ton of med chem um, as well, of course. Um, and so this all leads up to the fact that if you can just generate kind of, quote, optimized or developed drug-like molecules directly from your de novo library, if you can pull those out of your de novo library, they have, you know, presumably or hopefully um, lower exposed hydrogen bond donor count, lower molecular weight, lower total polar surface area, and are neutral, uh, then you're much further towards the finish line than you otherwise would be starting with a traditional phage or mRNA display hit. Um, point out, yeah, and I'll, and, and I'll leave you with one um, small nugget. Well, so this, this then, just, just to round this out, this um, kind of leads into our work with uh, Wu Xi. Um, and uh, we believe that, you know, mRNA, or I mean, um, Dell uh, is a fantastic way to um, optimize your library to have these uh, physical chemical properties on the outset. Uh, moving forward one, if you will, us. Thank you. And I'll just point out in this paper, um, I think Chu Gai has recognized exactly what what I've been uh, what we've been talking about here. Um, and and if you notice um, to the top left, the leftmost figure, they have this mRNA display hit that doesn't to me look like a traditional mRNA display hit. Uh, and I was looking at how they developed this or where they, you know, what platform they pulled this from. And uh, they're, uh, I think this is in, this is in review, I think, um, but, but they're calling out this paper that's, that, that should be reported uh, presently, I think, but it looks like they've, they've created a mRNA display platform uh, to minimize uh, hydrogen bond donors and include a number of unnatural amino acids um, in a way that you have a, a, um, uh, a fully amid backbone um, in the macrocyclic uh, portion of it too, which allowed them to not need to scaffold hop when developing the 18. So this will be really interesting to check out. Um, I want to keep keep our eyes on that. Um, and then moving forward, one. Oh yeah, perfect. So um, just just looking at this, um, you know, drug likeness. Um, quote on the on the x-axis and then chemical control um, on the y um, and and I'm just calling out here that you know our collaboration with Wu Xi was focused on um, uh, DNA encoded libraries that seek to give you these peptide or, or these these kind of optimized uh, peptide macrocycles directly off platform and Chu Gai um, I think has you know maybe drank the Kool-Aid as well and and is has developed their own mRNA display platform so we'll see where that lands um, and uh, Alex will go over um, now the library design that we used, how Wuxi is particularly and well suited, um, particularly capable and well suited to deliver these these kinds of hits. Um, and and a little note on how we follow them up. Um, later on, we can talk about you know any specifics around the paper. And um, happy to be interrupted. Of course, I meant to say this in the beginning. Uh, with any questions, um, just we can stop the presentation and. Uh, and answer those directly. So thank you all. And um, Alex will take over now and I'll maybe add a little bit later, but I um, appreciate the, um, uh, appreciate you guys listening. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Uh, yeah, so I'm Al Alex Sachs and yeah, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about how Wuxi makes our DELs and about our macrocyclic DELs in particular. And, and I think Tony really gave a great introduction um, and it really sets up this slide well about what the strengths and the weaknesses are of what we do and how what we do is different. And so compared to the other kinds of display platforms, the numbers of structures that we make are lower. But our goal here is to make macrocyclic rings that are smaller and that are much more unnatural than what you can make using these other kinds of platforms. And so here we're making macrocycles on solid phase. And so these are obocdels. And in this case, we're making a more traditional solution phase macrocyclic dels. Um, but in both cases, we can use chemistries and amino acids, which other kinds of platforms can't use. And so we can make rings which are smaller 
and look much more like a drug and much less like a peptide. Okay, so with that, uh, let me talk a little bit about how these DELs are made and what they look like. And so we can see what a library member looks like here. There's a barcode. And then there's a long flexible linker, although this looks pretty small and rigid, it's actually pretty long and flexible. And then we have a chemical structure, which in this case could be a peptide or it could be a macrocyclic peptide. And how these DELs are made is they're made via split and pool combi chem. So as a, for instance, we can have a mixture of three different things. And every one of these barcodes, if you were to read off the sequence, would then encode what the structure is. And we take this in our first split. And so we split this up into three different tubes. And in each one of these tubes, we put in a barcode. And that barcode encodes the chemistry that is going to occur on the left-hand side. And so for an instance here, we make three new structures. And we make three new barcodes so that each barcode specifically encodes what the chemical structure is. Since we've had this split size of three and three things in each tube, we have now made nine new structures, every structure encoded by a unique code. We now pull these together. And at any point in time, we can read off all the sequences of all the barcodes and we can determine what the relative concentrations are of all of the different structures. Now, of course, when we make a DEL, we generally don't use a split size of three. We might use a split size of 300 or a split size of 3000. And we don't make nine structures. We might make nine million structures or even nine billion structures. Now, how the affinity selection works is we immobilize the target onto a solid phase resin. And then we have this mixture of millions or billions of different discrete structures in a tube. And we, inc inc we incubate those with the protein target and most ligands don't properly fit any binding pocket. And those we just wash away. And what we're left, left with are those which are indeed bound. We then heat the protein up. The protein denatures a bit. Now the binding pocket is gone. And we can then elute what was bound. We capture this. We sequence it. And from the sequence of this code, we can determine what the chemical structure is. We can then resynthesize that structure without the barcode attached and we can test it for binding in a traditional compound profiling sort of assay. Okay, so that's the basics of what the DELs are and how they're made and how the screen is done. And so now we have made a set of macrocyclic peptide DELs. And the purpose of this side is to explain what those DELs look like. And so every cycle of chemistry is shown here with a different color. And so we add an amino acid, we add a second amino acid, we add a third, and then we add a fourth, and then we can add a different couple of linkers of different lengths. And then we can either cyclize to make our macrocyclic peptide, or we can reduce, and we can have the linear version then of all of the macro cycles. And so we can run screens by side by side, and we can find out is the macro cycle binding, is the linear version binding, or are both binding. And that can help us uh, ensure that when we resynthesize the hits that we are indeed resynthesizing the correct version. I would also point out that some of our DELs at the uh, chemistry cycle four, instead of using a normal amino acid, we have used a tetrapeptide. And so our resulting rings can ha ha have either six amino acids, or if we use the tetrapeptide, they can have nine. Okay, so let's look at an overview of what those macrocycles look like, and we can gain a little bit of insight into what their chem chemical structures are. So here we have the linear versions. We have a li linear version where building block four is the tetrapeptide and where it isn't. And then we have these three different cyclized macrocyclic peptides, one that has the short linker, uh, or two where the linker is short, and one where the linker is long. Um, and the case where the tetrapeptide is used at cycle four, we don't use the log linker. The split sizes are shown here. So we have five different DELs. We use over 500 different BBs at cycle one, for instance, over 500 at cycle two, 493 at cycle four. And then if we're using the tetrapeptide, we have a split size of 265 at cycle four, 
or if we're not using the tetrapeptide, we have a split size of 493. We use either the linker length that is short or long. The total of the new different numerical structures is shown here. And so some of these cells are 30 billion different structures and some are even double that in size. And the total am amino acid count is either nine or six, depending upon whether we use the tetrapeptide or not. And then we can talk a little bit about what are the uh, different amino acids that we're actually using here. Um, as a for instance, uh, in substituted, we have 51 of, of about 500 and 510 that, that, that we have used, so about 10% of the amino acids used have an N substitution. Um, as another example, about 110 have no chiral center, 161 are R and 215 are S and so on. Okay. And so UNP and Tony and myself and the Wuxi team, we published a paper. This was uh, earlier this year that it has come out. Um, here we had a group of macrocyclic DELs, which we screened against MDM2. We had numerous hits that showed up. The most enriched structure is shown here. We resynthesized this and we found it to be an extremely potent single digit nanomolar hit. And we also got a crystal structure of it as well. Um, Tony, is there anything that you would like to say about this paper before I move on to some new selection data? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I think just that um, just one point that, um, you know, if you look at that structure, um, if you look at the crystal structure there um, and read the paper thoroughly, there's, you know, I just want to call out that that, of course, this is a charge free binder that that is uh, so potent. And then um, a lot of the N, the um, backbone NHs and side chain side chain um, NHs um, are not uh, 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 making productive interactions with the protein. And so presumably can be N methylated. And so just this, this hit coming off of the Del uh, Wuxi's platform, um, is particularly well suited for further development. Um, you know, from a, you know, H bond donor, um, minimizing, uh, standpoint. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think I just wanted to call that out that it that it looks you know from from this crystal structure from um that that it's infinitely or not infinitely, but um very optimizable uh, yeah yeah and cer certainly further sar wasn't something that we did we just took the initial hit right out of the uh, screen um exactly. jumping into our next slide so now i'm going to show all completely unpublished and i don't believe this data has ever been disclosed so those of you who are watching or seeing it for the first time ever um, and this is about where we took our brand new macrocyclic DELs and we screened it against MDM2 again. And in this case, we are looking at uh, five different DELs. Each one of these DELs is uh, shown by a different color. And each one of these data points represents a discrete structure. And on the left-hand side, we have on the Y uh, axis, we show the enrichment of each one of these structures. And on the x-axis, we show the copy number. So this is really another version of looking at the, enri at the enrichment. And we have highlighted here um, three different hits. So these are some of the most enriched hits that have come out of the screen. And we can see the structures shown here. And in the next slide, I'm going to talk about these structures a little bit further. Okay, so if we look at the right-hand side of this um, uh, uh, slide, we see that the structures are shown here, structures one, two, and three, and their enrichment when MDMM2 is present in the DEL selection. In every case, the enrichment is quite high. And then when we remove the target and we look at the NTC, the no target control, the enrichment is completely wiped out. In addition, we have the linear version of this macrocyclic peptide DEL, which we have contained in those other DELs, and we see that those remain completely unenriched, whether or not MDM2 is added or not. And that is true in all three of these cases. And this increases our confidence level that it is indeed the macrocyclic peptide, which is binding to the target, and that the macrocytes cycle would be much more potent against the target than the linear version. If you look at the left-hand side of this slide, 
It's talking about the holistic overall performance of the cyclic DAOs versus their linear versions. So for instance, when we talk about the DAOs that contain that tetrapeptide at cycle four, so these are nonopeptides, almost everything that enriches is the cyclic version, and we only see the little tiniest bit of orange here representing a very small number of things that enriched in the linear version. For the hexapeptide, we do see a larger number of macros or, or of the linear structures, the linear peptides being in, uh, in, in, enriched, but the, the number is still quite small compared to the macrocyclic version. So what we do see consistently is that macrocycles tend to bind their targets um, better than the linear versions. So this is a very busy slide and there's a lot of data in it, but that's just the way of Dell. Dell creates a lot of structures and it creates a lot of data. Um, so I'll try to explain this a bit, what we're looking at here. Every one of the DELs that we make, these macrocyclic DELs, they all have four different cycles of chemistry. And here we're holding building block one and building block two constant. And we're allowing building block three and building block four to vary. So for instance, this data point here represents a, a fixed BB1 and BB2, but it could represent any number of different BB3s and BB4s. And then we can look at this data set a bit further. We can blow it out in this heat map, and we can see that the combinations of building block three and building block four, they vary, but there are certain combinations which are heavily enriched, and there are many other com combinations which don't enrich whatsoever. And so this is the sort of data that we have to look at in order to determine what is the SAR of these ring systems. Right, so this spells out the specific structures a bit more clearly. We have a case of all things that have enriched in a quite high fashion. And of interest here is that in the linear version of these DELs with these same, these same structures, the linear version, we don't see any enrichment whatsoever. We also don't see any enrichment when the linker length is short. So we only see enrichment when the link linker length is long in this case. And we can see what the different um, um, what the different BBs are at each of these cycles. And we see, for instance, here that the building block at cycle four is always the same. The building block at cycle three is the same. But we do see some variation at cycle two and at cycle one. This one is shown in red because this is the one which was enriched the most, and it's the one that we decided to resynthesize. Um, here is another case. In this case, none of these structures enriched for the linear version of this pep peptide, but they did enrich whether the, um, whether the uh, linker was short or long. It enriched in both those cases. And again, we can see that it's fixed at cycle one, it's um, largely fixed at cycle two, but it does vary a bit. We see some variation at cycle four, um, and we probably see the most variation at cycle three. But all of these structures do produce um, somewhat similar looking ring systems, um, which of course gives us a larger uh, degree of, con of confidence that these are indeed true, true binders and that they will be relatively potent. Again, we chose uh, the specific one, which whose enrichment is quite high to synthesize, and that's shown in red for that reason. Okay, so let's look at the first case. Now we can see the structure fully drawn out, and we can see that by MST, that one diastereoisomer is a relatively weak binder, and the other is quite strong. We don't know what the absolute configuration is in, in, in this case, but we do know that these go in as a racemate at this chiral center. Um, and so we have one of the diastereoisomers here and we capture the other one here during the pure purification by HPLC. And the direct MST binding is backed up by the TR fret, uh, where again, we show the same sort, sort of a theme. We go from double digit micromolar binder to single digit micromolar binder. Uh, depending upon which diastereoisomer we capture and, uh, and measure. And this is the other example here shown with an HRTF. Um, in this case, we just have the, the RASMATE version. 
Um, and we see that it is quite potent at 100 nanomolar potency. And here we have a third way in order to uh, measure the binding strength. Uh, we use an SEC-based ASMS uh, with a titration. We can determine both the, uh, the binding potencies of these two uh, macrocycle hits. Uh, one is 3.7 and the other is 1.5 micromolar. But we can also do a competition assay and we can determine that they bind to the same binding pocket as well. So that confirms the, uh, the other two slides that I just showed using a different method in order to determine binding affinity. Okay, so to summarize what we do on the Wuxi side, uh, we have a very large Dell group. And with this Dell group, we do conventional Dell screens. And here we have Dell Pro and we have a delight kit. The goal here is to find drug-like hits versus the targets which you wanna hit. Um, in the case of Dell Pro, you send the target to us and we screen it for you. And in the case of a Delight screen, we can send a non-exclusive kit to you and you can do the screen in your own lab. And what is nice about that, in this case, you don't even need to share the name of the target with us. We also have new types of Dells in order to find new types of hits. Included in that are these peptide Dells where we can find these macrocyclic peptide hits. We also have RNA focused DELs. So these are DELs we've screened certain R RNA, tar RNA tar targets. And so we have some data which tells us what kinds of structures tend to do well in these kinds of screens. And we have made certain DELs focused around those. Um, and lastly, we have made some covalent DELs. And so we have two different options again. We have a Dell Link Pro and we have a Dell Link Lite. And here the goal is to find hits that can target a cysteine at the binding site. And so if you have a target which is tough to drug and you have a cysteine in that binding po pocket and you think that you would like to find a hit that could target that cysteine, then, then the uh, Dell link might be an excellent option for you. And so as a whole, we, she bought, we, we can do ev everything from the protein production to running the screens, right? whether that's a HCS, a fragment screen, a Dell, or really anything else. And of course, any kind of follow-up um, assays or chemistry that you might need, we can take care of as well. Okay, and with that, Tony, I will hand this uh, final slide back to you. Um, and you can address this briefly if you would like. Great, yeah, thank you, Alex. Yeah, great, great, great overview there. Um, yeah, so for this talk, of course, we we kind of tailored it not to a, a full just recapitulation of our paper because you know, of course, you can just go go read that. But you know, um, here we're happy to um, uh, answer any questions you may have um, about that or anything we just discussed. Um, but I wanted to use this time to just call out uh, the folks that, that that did the work on that paper um, and thank them uh, specifically. So, you know, special thanks to Wuxi, um, Alex, and Wenxi um, specifically. Um, I'll, I'll call out from, from our side, from the UNP side, um, who did this work was uh, uh, Cy and um, Eric made all of the compounds and the chemistry, um, biology, um, Jenny and Walter uh, developed the FP assay, TR FRED assay, and cellular assays uh, for that. And then up at UCSC, uh, Seth Rubin and um, Sarvan Tripathi, um, they they obtained the crystal structure. Um, so I wanted to just give them a um, a shout out here. Uh, and then and then just to call out that we're just a hop, skip, and a jump from San Jose. So if you're in South San Francisco or San Jose. Um, come over the beautiful Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, we're right by the beach, uh, as you can see in the yellow arrow there. Um, and uh, come come visit us. We'd love to, you know, um, talk to other peptide believers. So um, with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. I think you might have one slide left, Alex. Or I might have one more, but that's a pretty simple one. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I think we should stop here because we're a little over time. And this way we'll have more... Uh, time for the Q&A. So I think we can hand it back over to our hosts. And I, I think Tony and I are ready to take on questions. Perfect. Thank you. All.
Thank you for a great presentation, Tony and Alex. We have just a few minutes left for questions. A uh, quick reminder to our audience, you can submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And any questions that we don't get to today will be answered by email after the event. Also, for some of uh, these questions, our speakers might opt to give more detailed answers by email um, in addition to answering the questions orally. OK, let's get to our first question. Uh, is there a strong preference for macro cycles over linear peptides? Who'd like to take that one? Maybe, Tony, you should start with that one. Yeah, yeah, I can take that one. Um, you, you know, for for us, um, there 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 is. Um, you know, there I've, of course there are a number of <clears throat> um, peptide drugs in the clinic and 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 that are commercial um, that are linear. But uh, we feel that you know when when um, uh, 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 targeting intracellular PPIs uh, particularly, uh, th there is a massive benefit to having. Um, a macrocycle um, as opposed to a linear peptide, and this is because, you know, a lot of the hydrogen bond donors that that you are um, obligated to have to have good uh, solubility, uh, those can be in in a macrocycle or a macrocyclic context. Those can be shielded. Um, those can be you know sequestered as they're uh, or uh, internally and intramolecularly as uh, the molecule is 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 adopting a confirmation that allows it to traverse the cell membrane. And so in the context of cell permeable peptides, <clears throat> truly passively cell permeable peptides, yes, um, a macrocycle, I, in our opinion, is, is, uh, is definitely beneficial for that uh, okay. in that context. Thank you. Next question. Are C log P calculators for macrocycles very reliable? Um, in general, so we use um, <clears throat> this. We use actually um, in in many cases, and for, for many of our series, we use a uh, uh, a log p uh, calculator, essentially that that, that was that was um, uh, developed by Gose and uh, Crippen in um, 1986. Actually, um, they have they have a nice, really nice paper. Um, in 80, the, the two papers, 86 and 87, um, in the uh, Journal of uh, uh, Chemical Information Modeling, I believe it is, J Compute Chem as well, um, that 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 we use, and and that and that gives a good um, uh, 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 reliable values for um, for. For a log p or b, you know lipophilicity for us, yeah. Okay. That well, that specifically that 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 correlates well with with uh, PAMPA permeability values and where and where we think those molecules are on a lipophilicity scale. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Next yes. question: What is the success rate for finding macrocycle hits against targets, including PPI targets? Yeah, I, I think I need to take that that one. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We we don't have an extremely large and robust data set to answer this, but but we do know that the macrocycles tend to do better than other types of cells where the compound structures are smaller when we go up against PPIs or we're targeting proteins. We were we're pretty sure, and we know in advance that nice binding pockets don't exist. So the mac macro cycles definitely do better against PPIs and those types of targets. Um, as, far as, as far as the hit rate for those types of, uh, of uh, tar targets, I, 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 think, I think I would refrain from giving a specific number. I, I think we need to, to do more screening and follow-up work to give a good percentage. Um, I, I do know from work that other people have done that when macrocyclic rings become smaller, and they become smaller to the size that we operate in, certainly the hit rate is, is not as high as it is for when the macrocyclic rings are much larger. So that is a, a, a downside for having smaller rings and screening smaller rings, but, 
But the positive side is when you do get hit with these smaller rings, I, I think you have a better chance of having something that you can get inside of a, uh, a cell. Okay. Uh, we're going to go just a couple of minutes over the hour uh, to answer a couple more questions, if everybody can just hang with us. Uh, next question, is the synthesis of macrocycle peptides challenging compared to linear peptides? Um, how about, yeah. Tony, I'll, I'll, I'll start off with an answer from my, my side, and then you can go to yours. Does that sound, Perfect. sound good? Perfect, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. At least in, in our hands, the synthesis of the macrocyclic peptides has gone reasonably well, and it's been fairly straightforward. Um, so I would, I would say that from our perspective, we don't find following up potential hits to be a problem from the synthetic side. Uh, t Tony, your, your group has, a, has, has done a lot of work in this too, then. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we, no, we find that we don't really have an issue. I mean, you know, I guess you can, you can kind of quanti or, you know, uh, dive deeper into that question um, when you start thinking about all the ways to macrocyclize. Um, but if you're referring to a, you know, let's say just just head to tail or native backbone macrocyclization, um, we find that with with comudipia <clears throat> um, or uh, DIC oxima um, that we have a, a pretty good conversion rates um, for. Uh, for macrocyclization, uh, most of our issues occur when when we're using unnatural amino acids that have an end methylation as well as uh, beta branching um, on the side chain, and so that's and and of course that's that's um, an issue for linear peptides as well. But um, but that's that's kind of where we don't get full coupling, and uh, that 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 can be an issue uh, for sure where we have truncations uh, that arise from incomplete. Uh, amino acid elongation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up, how effective is the PAMPA assay to mimicking an actual cell membrane? Is the PAMPA membrane glycosylated since nearly all cells are heavily decorated with lipids and sugars? If not, what other artificial membranes are available that can more closely model cell membranes? Yeah, Tony, um, this one's definitely for you, I think. Yeah, yeah, this one, yeah, yeah, no, I can take, um, <clears throat> you know, so I'm I'm actually at the uh, Boulder Peptide um, Symposium here in, in Napa, ironically, and um, uh, this is a good question here because someone gave a talk, um, and I forget um, just who it was. I think they're at, they're at, they're at MIT, uh, and, they're, and, and they've uh, developed a, High throughput system to use pig intestine. They culture pig intestine in a 96 well uh, uh, format to uh, to answer this question or or have a better um, uh, PAMPA membrane assay. So yeah, I mean in my mind, so I, I I go back and forth with some folks on this whether you know how just how much you can quantitatively rely on PAMPA. Um, my understanding is that you know. The PAMPA membrane, it, 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 it isn't glycosylated. It isn't de uh, uh, decorated with lipids. Um, it is uh, 50 micrometers in size as opposed, you know, so maybe a thousand fold larger than a, a, than a cell membrane, a lipid bilayer. And uh, so that, that obviously has, has kind of deleterious effects. And, and um, you know, there are, of course, numerous reports in literature of, of affecting and, and um, uh, running Pampa with with a variety of conditions or in a variety of conditions, whether you have sync conditions, you have you know maybe BSA um, on the acceptor well side, or you run it with with um, acetonitrile or some other sort of co-solvent that facilitates compound dissolution. Um, those all affect the flux across that membrane and all. Um, are kind of specific for the molecule you're looking at and, and, and whether that gives you a good judgment of its true uh, uh, permeability into cells. So, you know, I think it's, it's um, you can kind of shift it around with the experimental uh, 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 um, specifics there and, and um, to, you know, 
to get what 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 kind of value you're, you're looking for, or more, you know, importantly, just be able to judge how uh, your your molecules are performing. So um, I think it's you know we don't take it as the ground truth. Maybe I'll end with this: is that we don't take it as the ground truth, and and we definitely also look at recovery values because incorporation of that small amount of material in the PAMPA membrane um, and then not being able to see that by mass spec subsequently when you're looking at trying to gauge the flux that that we we um, we we look at and 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 we quantify so I think that's an important thing if you, you know your compound just fully saturates the membrane and, and, and you don't see much recovery I think that's m maybe an also uh, uh, an important point to just note when you're when you're looking at larger molecules, specifically macrocycles or protax. Um, so we don't take it as the ground truth. Uh, we do it on everything. <laughs> um, so uh, a little, you know, maybe two-sided answer there. Um, but okay. it's a good, very, very good, very good uh, question. All right. Thank you. I'm afraid we are out of time for today. Uh, before we go, Alex and Tony, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? Hmm. Yeah, final thoughts. I, I mean, <laughs> to me, this is an area that people have had an interest in for a very long time, but, but it's taken the sci scientific uh, work for, for, for quite a while in order to get to a point where we can consistently screen novel macrocyclic peptides like this. So uh, I, I, I'm definitely very curious where this is going to go over the next few years. All right. All right. Thank you again to our speakers for a fascinating presentation. And thank you to our participants for being a great audience and on 24 for technology and production services. And thank you, Wuxi AppTech, for the sponsorship that made this interactive webcast possible. Please be sure to check CNEN or CNEN online for information on upcoming webinars. For CNEN webinars, I'm Catherine Doles. Goodbye. Thank you.